Okay, should be recording now. And let me collapse this. So that's, now I have access to everyone's messages. Perfect, and I can jump into the slides. So I wanna catch this on the recording for anyone who does this on a rewatch. I just wanna um, kind of remind everyone that the format that I'm envisioning for this course is that the lectures, uh, uh, later on, I'll like the lectures to uh, have more practical components where I'll justify some of the steps that occur in the labs and to do some uh, edge case and do some debugging and do um, some, some actual workshop style coding in the lectures. But before we get to that point, I wanna use my lecture time to cover really important concept oriented things and then the labs will serve to give you a practical understanding. The labs will follow behind these concepts that were going off initially so that you can actually see these things in practice. So the lecture, so the slides I develop for today's lecture, for instance, we'll talk a lot about CSS. It'll be a crash course in CSS since we did our crash course last lecture on HTML. Again, we're focused on client side technologies. We're, we're, we're gonna learn how to use the browser application to produce a, uh, the, the browser to produce a client side application. And so to do that, we first have to understand how to use HTML, declarative language. So it's not a hard language to learn. It's just a matter of learning all the key words that you can declare. CSS in, in the same facet is a declarative language, which means that it's not a hard language to learn. You just have to learn the key words and you declare things. There's no state that you typically have to worry about. There's no control flow like you would have on an imperative language. And so once we're done today's lecture, you should know enough about HTML and CSS to hit the ground running. Uh, we'll focus one more lecture probably on Bootstrap, which will be a CSS library and then we'll pivot to JavaScript and start learning how to actually code within the application window. So these initial set of lectures will be more geared towards uh, really keen in on the critical concepts that you should be thinking about now and should kind of know about how browser development works. Then, they'll, then those will have a companion lab where you'll actually implement the things we're discussing in these lectures. And that'll be followed by companion homework that'll challenge you to actually implement the concepts that you just kind of step through in the labs. So does, does that kind of flow of the way that we're gonna go through the content, at least initially, make sense to everybody? So before I move forward, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll probably reserve, um, if you have any questions, again, uh, please use Discord. I see that there's a number of people already asking questions there. It's been pretty active. I'm pretty happy with the community that we have there. So at any time that we're not in lecture, you can always go to the Discord uh, server for uh, any kind of uh, feedback or, or explanations or answers or whatnot. So let me just go through my slides with the CSS stuff, and then we can talk a little bit more about concepts that might be baffling that relate to either HTML or CSS. So this is still week one. This is lecture two of our advanced web application. So today I want to focus on really doing a, uh, a quick crash course in CSS. Again, as I stated previously, this is an opinionated uh, of, uh, coursework, which means that I get to decide what I think is the most critical thing. So I try to condense the most important aspects from my perspective of CSS into this lecture and anything outside this scope, we have tons of resources that you can expand out on, uh, such as MDN or W3Schools or a number of other things that I've put onto Moodle. Um, but, you know, uh, I think everyone here is at least a sophomore level computer science major. So CSS, I don't think will be that difficult to grasp. And a lot of it, you can kind of lean on some of the syntax that you learned in Java uh, to, get, to get familiar with this. So today's lecture, I kind of want to focus on uh, just kind of explaining what CSS is, how to get CSS into your HTML document, the syntax, uh, the selectors, 
uh, how we define colors inside of CSS and inside the browser, how we can get fonts into the browser, how we define spacing and backgrounds, how we can customize the default styles to be more unique uh, um, within the browser and how to go ahead and also how to align our elements. And we'll talk about two different approaches that we can align our elements using CSS3 in the most modern version of CSS. Let's see, uh, what were last lecture slides labeled as on Moodle? It's in the very bottom section of Moodle. So if you, if, if you uh, I don't think I'm loaded into Moodle, but here I'll, show, I'll, I'll see if I can't log in really quick. So if I hop into Moodle, sign in, Okay, here we go. Pancakes because we do full stack development. And here we should have lecture PowerPoints. And if I click view section um, uh, module, it should have week one slides one. And so after I get my video, I'll go ahead and publish a PDF that's week one slides two, essentially. And I'll try to organize the, um, the lectures by, I guess, week seems to be the natural approach I'm going for for some reason. Okay. So what is CSS? CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. Uh, as I stated earlier, it's a declarative style, styling language. So it's a declarative language, much like HTML is, uh, which means it's pretty simple to learn. Uh, the role of CSS is to describe how HTML elements are displayed in our viewport. And the reason we should care about CSS is because it saves a lot of work for us. It allows us to define the styles for any number of web pages all at once just by importing that one CSS file. And so one of the really key motivating factors about learning how to use CSS, I mean, besides making your web content, your web pages look pretty, and to style them in interesting and unique ways. But it also allows us to apply the drive principle where we don't have to repeat ourselves. Once we define a style inside of a CSS file, that's what we call our external style sheets, then we can import that set of styles into any number of uh, websites, any number of HTML documents we're working on, and those styles can be applied to that document. And so, so this concept of applying styles by being able to import an external style sheet and being able to select HTML elements to style uh, is what gave rise to all the number of styling libraries that are available now. So in today's lesson, we're gonna learn the nitty gritty about CSS, how CSS as a language is actually parsed by the browser and how it actually goes ahead and um, uh, styles and and uh, and beautifies your web content so that it renders correctly. Uh, and once we learn how it does that, we'll probably step away from CSS for most of our projects and actually start using a library that will do us for uh, do that for us. So uh, you will get an opportunity to do handwritten CSS, and you'll see that it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work to customize CSS, which is why libraries exist, but we'll talk more about that uh, later. So CSS solved a huge problem for HTML. Back in HTML3, CSS was not a thing yet. So HTML was originally intended just to contain tags to format web content, to, to format web pages, like to define whether something should be a heading or a paragraph, whether it should be an anchor tag, whether it should be an image. But as browsers became more and more advanced, web content became less and less like what was appearing inside of a primitive text editor. And there was a demand to increase the ability to format and style the content displayed in the viewport. And so that's where CSS emerged from. So we wanna make this huge distinction right here and now that HTML is intended to describe the content of a web page. Uh, so again, like a heading element, a paragraph element, and then the CSS roles is to define all the styling for the web page, just like JavaScript will be responsible for all the logic of a web page. And that's together, all three of those technologies pull together to create a web application. So in many ways, you could think of CSS as essentially the, the aesthetic uh, 
view of our web page and then our, um, our JavaScript would be all the logic. So let's talk about how we can import CSS into our HTML documents. Super easy. All we do is we link it in. So inside the head element of the HTML uh, file, we can use a link element. The link element will require two attributes. One is a hyper reference that will have the file pathway to our CSS file. And the other will be a relationship reference letting the browser know what type of relation is this link, how to parse this link. So we have to let it know when we give a link to a CSS document that it should parse that as a style sheet. If you forget to put what the relationship attribute is, you will not get any style. So it's as simple as that. Once you have a CSS file, you just link it right in the head. Um, I don't know why, hey, let's see, that's why, there we go. Let's remove that. I have two head tags in there, so we will edit that right now. Perfect. So right inside the head, we would go ahead and just link that as such. Super simple. So let's talk about the syntax of uh, CSS. So CSS uses a rule set, and it's typically a selector followed by a declaration block. So a selector selects what HTML uh, elements to grab from the HTML document to apply a style to. A declaration block opens a declaration uh, with a curly brace and closes a declaration block with a curly brace. So this concept of code blocks is very similar as it is in Java. So the selector, so in, in this instance, this selector would grab all HTML elements that are of the type heading one. And then it actually contains two different declarations. And each declaration is uh, ended with a semicolon, very similar to Java. So each declaration has a property of that element, of, of that style, and a value that you want to define. So in this example, we have two declarations, one to affect the color. And the value we want to set to the color of the font would be blue. One to affect the font size. And here, the size, we're using a pixel, a numerical value uh, indicating the pixel value of the font size. So it's in, it, essentially, it's a key value pair. And for each key value pair, for each property and value, we put a semicolon. And so yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. You can declare as many. Uh, as many stylings as you want for any particular selector uh, with this mechanism. Now, another important thing to note is unlike in Java, it is appropriate to have property names uh, that have dashes in there. This, again, this isn't a imperative language, so uh, the dash can be used as a dash and doesn't necessarily parse that as a minus symbol, which is what happens in Java. So you will come across names like this that do have a dash in between, which would be invalid in a, in a, as an identifier or as the label for a variable in a um, in Java. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, more about selectors. There's three basic types of selectors in CSS. There's a element selector, there's a class selector, and there's an ID selector. There's more advanced versions of selectors too. Uh, I'll mention them just briefly but we won't cover them in, in great detail like we would the basic ones. So the distinction between an element selector, a class selector, and ID selector is essentially how you're grabbing those elements. So an element selector uses the element type. The, the example I just showed you previously was an element selector. It would grab all H1 elements from the HTML document and apply that style. Uh, a class selector would grab only those elements that have a particular class name or class label. And an ID selector will only grab an HTML element that has that ID uh, label. And so let me distinguish right now between a class label and an ID label and an HTML element. So every HTML element can either have a class name or an ID name. The distinction between the two is that an ID should be unique. There should only ever be one HTML element that has that ID, and that HTML element can only have a single ID. Uh, 
Whereas with a class, multiple HTML elements can have the same class name. And in fact, a single HTML element can have multiple classes and be a part of multiple classes. Does, does that distinction make sense between the difference between classes and IDs in terms of labeling things in HTML? Because, because that distinction is really going to be important to highlight that the industry standard of what basic selector you should define when you build your own CSS uh, libraries should be the class selector. So most of the time, if you're going to use something like Bootstrap, a CSS library, it is a predefined CSS file that co contains a large amount of class selectors. And as long as you know what those class selector names are, you can apply those class names to your HTML elements, import the, the CSS library, and your entire document, your entire website is styled for you with little work of having to actually do any personal styling. And so that'll make building uh, nice, responsive websites very quick and easy as we move forward in this semester. Okay, so additional selectors would be combinator selectors. So this is where you can select an element based off of a specific relationship between them. This might be like whenever I have a div inside a div, if there's a paragraph, I want all those paragraphs inside divs to have a particular type of style. So it allows you to start combining uh, 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 a, 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 a select. So it meets a certain criteria. You have these pseudo class selectors which can select an element based off of when it's in a certain state. I'm not gonna really highlight that too much inside of this lecture, but when you hit the lab, the lab inside the HTML element customization section will cover a couple of these more advanced selectors. So one example of that might be if you wanna change the color of a button when you're hovering over it, that would use a pseudo class selector. And again, you'll get an example of that in the lab so you can see how that works. You also have like pseudo element selectors, which can select a st uh, select and style just a part of an element. And then finally, an attribute selector where you can select an element based off of having a particular attribute defined. But, uh, and again, you can learn more about these here, these more advanced ones at MDN, W3 schools, or the lab. I really want to focus on these because these are the ones that are far more common the element selectors, the class selectors, and the ID selectors. Okay, so let me give you examples of these. So an example of a uh, each of these selectors is going to be defined inside the styles.css here. And so this is my index.html document. So here you can see inside my head, I'm linking this CSS file. So I'm going to be able to have access from my CSS file to these HTML documents, uh, to the elements in my HTML document. So the element selector is just uh, the element name, and then it's the declaration block, and then whatever declarations I have in there. So I highlighted this red to see that I have one H1 element, two paragraph elements. So this H1 would get selected by this CSS, and the font color would be uh, red. And so the alternate approach is I can do a class selector, which will try to select any HTML element that has a class name that is set to HTML dash class. And so I preface a class selector with a period. So in order to dereference a class name in CSS, I put, a, I, I, I put a period and then whatever class name I want to select on, and then I can define my declaration block. And then if I want to try to select a element by its ID value, then I preface the ID label with a hashtag in my, in my selector area. So this is how I define ID selectors, this is how I define class selectors, this is how I define element selectors. It's that simple. So you'll be able to select a, a variety of elements based off of those different attributes. And so just to give a quick uh, rundown of all the basic type of simple selectors that you'll have access to, Again, your general form is here. So you can either select using hashtag and then whatever the ID is of your element to grab a particular uh, element. Again, IDs should be unique to a single element. Uh, if you want to use a class name, you can have 
a multiple elements that use the same class or a single element could have multiple classes, you'd use a period prefaced in front of whatever the class name is. You can actually do a combination of the two. So you can use the element uh, type and period then followed by the class name. So if you had a paragraph element and you only want to select the paragraph elements that have the intro class name and apply a style for that, you could do that. You could select based off of that kind of granularity. If you want to select everything in the HTML document, you could just use the wildcard, the asterisk, the star character before defining your uh, declaration block. And then we've already seen here the elements, the most common one, that just be the element type. But if you want to have multiple styles apply to a group of elements, you can just use a comma separated list. This way you can kind of minimize the number of styles you defined if you have many that are similar. So say for instance, if you wanted to have similar styles between uh, unordered lists and ordered lists, this allows you to do that. Okay, so let me move on to cascading order. Uh, so we talked a lot about style sheets and what, what these uh, style sheets mean in terms of styling your HTML elements, but I want to hit on this concept of what does it mean to be a cascading style sheet. And so the real takeaway here is that cascading, um, that uh, first, it, uh, I, I guess I should preface by saying, let's examine how an HTML document is actually modeled. Uh, I don't know if you've realized this based off of the way that we've been using the markdown or the markup, but HTML documents are actually modeled as a tree. It's a tree of elements. So the root node of an HTML document is the HTML element, which has two children, a body element and a head element. And that body element can have any number of children. Let's say, for example, it has a heading one uh, element and it contains a div element. And then that, that div element can have any number of children, such as a image element and a paragraph element. So if I was to graphically display the structure of my HTML document, it would look just like a tree from data structures. So what it means to cascade a style sheet means that for any given node inside this HTML tree, when I apply a style to that node, that style will cascade down to all of its children. And so that's what it means to cascade. So a style, so styling this diff element will also style this image and this paragraph. And then I can override that inherited style by applying a style directly to that element. But what this means is that if I was to apply, say for instance, a background color to body, to the body element, that means the entire document, that means every child element would inherit that background color unless I went and then overwrote it uh, underneath it. So there is, a, there is very much a concept of inheritance to the way that styles are applied to your HTML document. Okay, with that said, there's another concept for concept, uh, cascading order as well. Uh, in, this, in this set of slides, I'm primarily going to focus on external style sheets, so ones that have to be linked to the document, but understand that there are other ways to embed styles. So you can actually do inline styles where you define a style attribute directly inside the heading tag of an element. You can create an internal style sheet which is a set of script tags that would have all of your CSS defined inside of the head. Or you can have external CSS file that you link into the HTML. Both those uh, are appropriate ways to define a uh, styles, although external files are better because they can be applied to more uh, HTML websites. If anything that's defined explicitly in one page can only be used in that page, so that's never the that's never the approach that we want to use. And of course, you have your default browser uh, styles, which would be the default browser font, the the default bullet points, the default border lines, all the things that naturally render are by default uh, the the style that is given if you don't give it a style via CSS. And so the order in which it prioritizes which style to use is as such, because this is important. You might try to apply style and it doesn't work. So you have to understand uh, the, the um, you have to understand the priority in which styling occurs. So the least important thing, the thing that it, it, it looks at 
So I'm going to start at the bottom here. The thing that it starts with is the browser default. Any um, explicit styling on top of that will override what the browser's default styles are. So the next thing in this priority is going to be either external or internal style sheets. Now, this is the important thing. If you have more than one style sheet or if you have more than a, uh, a, a yeah, if you have more than one style sheet or more than one set of styles, it will always use the last set of styles to style with. So if you are importing, let's say, a CSS library and you create custom CSS, your order of importing is going to matter. Make sure that you import your custom CSS after the library CSS if you are looking to override that functionality. And uh, the highest priority of styling goes to those that are the inline styles directly defined inside the HTML attribute element. So just so you know, if you try to apply a style and it's not working, make sure that there's not a set of styles that might be superseding the ones you're trying to apply. So this is for debug reasons, just to know these concepts here. OK, I want to move a little bit away from uh, the syntax uh, concepts. And I want to start talking about some more interesting uh, concepts, some of the more uh, finely tuned things, things that we can actually start um, um, performing on our HTML elements. One of the most critical things that is styled in web pages is color. And so we could use color to change the background. We can change, use color to define font colors. I think those are pretty much the two ways you, you apply colors, either to the, the text fonts itself or to the background container, whether that's the body or whether that's to a div or a paragraph or whatever. So we have to talk a little bit about how we define color in the browser. And there's actually a multitude of ways that color can be encoded. So I just want to make sure that everyone has at least a primitive understanding of all these different schemes. Uh, we have predefined color names. And in fact, the, all browsers support 140 predetermined, predefined color names. And so I'll give as a reference all those names inside this uh, PowerPoint slide, but I'm not going to cover them inside the lecture. I'll just let you use that as a resource. Uh, beyond that, I mean, there, 140 is a lot, but it's still relatively limited. So you have much better granularity to defining colors using a number of encoding schemes. They have RGB, which is a decimal encoding for each of the primary colors according to light theory, which is going to be red, green, and blue. You have uh, hexadecimal encoding, which the hex coding is just the hexadecimal, the base 16 of the RGB decimal representation. And so that kind of conserves a little bit of space going from base 10 to base 16. So those are actually analogous to one another. Anything you can represent as RGB, you can represent as hex. Anything that you can represent as a hex encoding can be represented as an RGB. They're synonymous with one another. And then you have a whole different format for encoding color, which is called HSL. It's also a decimal encoding scheme that defines um, it def defines color based off of its hue, its saturation, and its lightness. And so uh, that's RGB, that's hex, that's HSL. You also have RGBA, which is just RGB, but it has an alpha channel to be able to have either an opacity or transparency. So that value is between zero to one, where one is opaque and uh, zero is completely transparent. And that's the same thing with HSLA here. Uh, the hue, uh, saturation, lightness value is this A is just your alpha channel. OK, so just a quick examples of these. I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to make sure that you kind of understand what these formats look like. So again, RGB is a decimal encoding, which means it's a base 10 coding for each of the primary colors in light theory. So you have the value of red, which can have a, uh, a value map anywhere between 0 to 255. That's the max value. Uh, same for green, any value between 0 to 255. And blue can have any value from 0 to 255. So when we go to format something as an RGB encoding, we would use RGB and then parentheses, almost like it's a function call. And we would pass in three parameters separated by commas, where it has to be scoped between 0 to 255. That's your min and max value. So it's anything. So it could be any sets of values from 0, 0, 0 to 255, 255, 255. And they're in the order that they're given here as RGB. So the first value is your red value. The second value is your green value. The third value is your blue value. 
And so if you calculate the number of permutations you can have, that's over 16 million different colors. That's fantastic. That's more encodings than what monitors can actually display color-wise. I think we're limited on monitor fidelity at 14,000 colors. So we can create encodings that your human eye can't even perceive the difference between. Um, okay, oh, don't want to jump there yet. Okay, so to give some basic examples of how these RGB uh, encodings actually look like, if I wanted to encode red, I would set my red component max to 255, and I would set the green and the blue to zero. And be very similar for green, right? I would set the green component to be a max value, and then zero and zero for the red and blue portions. And very similar for blue, I would set the blue to be max, and then the red and green components to be zero, zero. Now, if you want to alter the shade of red, green, or blue, you can lower that number to say 120, 200, right? That'll give you a darker red, that'll give you a darker green, that'll give you a darker blue, the lower that number gets towards the zero. So if you want secondary colors, that's where you are combining your primary colors to actually generate yellow, for instance, that is going to be combining the red and the green channels essentially. Uh, produce yellow. Fuchsia is your red and your blue, and aqua is going to be your green and your blue. Uh, black is encoded as all zero, so the lack of all light is uh, produces black, and when all light is turned on, when it's all set to max, 255, 255, 255, that'll produce white. An equal value in between those produce all your grays. So if you want a medium gray, you could do something like 120, 120, 120. And so, yeah, that's how that is a, uh, a very common scheme, RGB, to be able to go ahead and encode uh, uh, any color. In fact, there's a lot of color pickers, a lot of color selectors that you can play around with to get the color you want by eye, and then it'll generate the RGB value for you. Now, as I said, uh, a hex color encoding is just a hexadecimal encoding for those RGB decimal representations. So in this instance, we can encode using hexadecimal a value between 0 to 255 from base 10 to a value between 0 to FF in base 16 in the hexadecimal number. So our red value can be anything from a 0, 0, because we can encode all possible values using just two, uh, two digits. And that's why hexadecimal values are very popular. Is it's a way of reducing the amount of space it takes to encode the color. Uh, so we can define a red with the first two sets of digits. We define our green with the second two sets of digits, and we define our blue value with our third set of two digits. So when we format it, we format a hexadecimal color encoding with a hashtag, and then it's your red information, your green information, your blue information. So very similar to RGB, I gave examples right here, but your primary colors where the red would just be set to the max of FF and then zeroed out for your green and your blue. The green would have the red and the blue portion set to zero and maximum uh, hexadecimal value of FF where the green component is. And then inside of the blue encoding, just the uh, last set of um, digits is toggled on to FF. And then we can combine these. So again, yellow would be your red and your green. Fuchsia would be your red and your blue, and aqua would be your green and your blue. And so black, very similar, all zeros. White would be all Fs. And so you can see that this is corresponds exactly. So you could easily map between RGB and hex. So the, these are the primary ways, typically, you would define colors, uh, either as a hex value or RGB. I don't want to spend as much time with HLSL, it's not as common, but I want you to be at least familiar with how it's encoding the color. So HSL stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. And so essentially you can think of hue as a degree on the color wheel. So that means it can go from zero to 360 degrees. So zero is the red portion of your color wheel, 120 is your green portion, and 240 is your blue portion. And so you would rotate around that. Uh, your saturation is a percentage value. So zero means it's a shade of gray and 100% means it's a full color. And so you can kind of saturate it from full color to just uh, a gray shade, depending on that percentage that you apply. 
And then the lightness value is also a percentage where 0% of lightness is black, 100% of uh, lightness uh, is white. And so I give the primary color representations, the secondary color uh, uh, representations, and the grayscale color representations. To me, this, this scheme is much more difficult and clumsy to work with outside of maybe actually being able to visually see your color wheel and be able to toggle around with your saturated uh, saturations and lightnesses. I, I have a much better grasp of visualizing the RGB and hex color encoding. I think that's probably a reason why those are more popular. Uh, and then, yeah, I've, I mentioned this before, but there's just a slide showing how the opacity and transparency works on the alpha channel. Essentially, it can be a number anywhere between zero to one. So it's gonna be a fractional value. At one, it's completely opaque. At zero, it's completely transparent. And any value in between then is gonna essentially be the ratio of opacity to transparency. And then, like I said, as a resource, we'll not go through all these names, but I give you a color swatch as well as the actual name of all the 140 predefined colors that the browser supports. So if you don't want to do RGB encoding, if you don't want to do hex encoding to define your colors, these are all the supported colors that you can give beyond just like red, blue, green, and whatnot. You can see there's a couple of pages. And again, there's always these references. Perfect. So that should cover for the most part all the color, all the um, color encoding that you can do in CSS and all the different formats that you'll come across as you do research. So the next thing I kind of want to discuss about styles and especially styling with CSS is fonts. So now that we've talked about the most important, which is being able to define how we can make things any number of different colors we care about, uh, let's talk about how we can actually start importing and using different fonts outside of the default font. So I'll cover the generic font families. I want to cover the font properties that you'll have access to from CSS. And then I want to talk about this really cool set of uh, libraries that Google provides called Google Fonts. And then I want to just give a little bit of information about pairing fonts so that we don't get to um, MySpace with fonts where you know there's a set of um, kind of uh, UI principles we want to adhere to, to try to keep our font usage at least moderately professional. So let's start off by defining the, our generic set of font families. So there are five generic types of fonts. You have serif fonts, you have sans serif fonts, you have monospace fonts, you have cursive fonts, and you have fantasy fonts. So the serif fonts are the ones that have those little flourishes. They have small strokes at the edges of each letter. So here is, an uh, is a depiction of a serif font. And so the purpose of those little st small strokes is to create a sense of formality or elegance towards that text. Whereas sans serif fonts right here have clean lines. There's no strokes that are attached to it. And again, they're supposed to create a greater sense of a uh, modern or minimalistic look. And so typically, sans serif fonts are easier to read than serif fonts. But they both have their own practical use cases. So here is if I was to overlap the serif font on top of the uh, sans serif font. And you could see how they would distinguish from one another. On top of that, you also have monospace fonts. Here are all the letters have the same fixed width. Typically, when we edit our code, most code editors use a monospace font. And so, for instance, this allows us to ensure that we can always tab over and that our code blocks are consistently the same block size because you don't have to worry about like M consuming more space than the letter L. Monospace ensures that all the letters consume the same amount of space so that each unit letter is equivalent to one another. And so they, they, that purposely creates a mechanical look. Uh, great for code blocks. Uh, cursive fonts try to imitate human handwriting. So they're supposed to convey a creative handcrafted look. And finally, fantasy fonts are kind of a decorative font that kind of create a whimsical or playful style look. So all fonts that you might come across will be lumped into one of these five kind of general font styles. And so here I just give a couple of basic examples 
real world examples with the font names of what might be a serif versus a sans serif versus a monospace versus a cursive versus a fantasy font. And so let's talk about the font properties. Uh, I'm going to ignore the font because this just allows you to um, set all of these unique ones. So the actual properties that you can go ahead and control from your CSS would be the font name. So that will let you be able to uh, distinguish between, say, an Arial versus a Calibra versus a New Times Roman font type. So you would pass that in as a string, essentially. Uh, the font size can be defined either as uh, pixels or as a percent rating as a number or as a view as a view width number or even as what's called an M number, which is a very abstract concept related just to fonts. But the understanding here is when you set your font size, you, you set it based off of typically a um, typically a a number, but the unit can vary. And so whenever you use that number, you should attach what unit of measure you want your font size to adhere to, whether it's going to be pixels or percentage or viewport width. And I would just advocate that you play around with the different, uh, each of these units so you get a good understanding of how those are set. Uh, the font style that a font can have is either just normal or italic. So if you want to italicize, you would set the font style with that. A font variant, uh, the default value of font variant is just normal. That means you have access to uh, capital letters and lowercase letters. For small caps, the lowercase letters are replaced with small capital letters. So if you want to get a, so if you want to have fonts that display so such that all your lowercase letters are replaced with smaller cap letters, you can you can do that as well. And then finally, you can control the weight of your font by either bolding it or having it be normal or even making it a little bit lighter. So you can see you have a lot of control over the ability to display fonts and to be, uh, be able to use a lot of different fonts for your uh, web pages. So I want to talk about fonts that are not part of the browser category, but are part of Google fonts, because this is where I think using fonts becomes a lot more diverse and a lot more fun, and where you can spend a lot of time kind of selecting your own unique styles. So Google fonts is a library of over a thousand free licensed font families that you can download and provide locally, or you could just link directly from the Google fonts library page. Uh, in addition to having this massive library, they provide an interactive web directory such that you can just browse their library. Uh, there's also even an API attached so that you can customize with effects. So let me just follow this link so you can just see what fonts.google.com goes to. You see it just loads and you have this massive collection of fonts. You can type in here, you can type something like, um, uh, interactive story title. And then you could actually see what something typed in here, and then you could select something and then actually be able to access that font. Uh, you can also look based off the categories. We kind of talked about serif, sans serif, uh, handwriting, monospace, and display, which is, I guess, their word for fantasy. You could check by basic font properties where you filter based off the styles or thickness, slants, or widths. So there's a lot of cool things going on here. I definitely recommend everyone uh, take a look at the Google fonts. And how to use a Google font? The same way you would normally link a CSS uh, style sheet. You just add a style sheet link in your head, and you link it to either the downloaded font or to the uh, HTML page uh, that uh, Google provides to you. So I'll give you an example of that so you can actually see right here. So imagine if I wanted to use this uh, audio wide font from Google fonts. And I would just create a link right inside of the uh, head of the HTML document where I would give it a hyper reference. And here, uh, this would just be a link directly to Google's API, uh, font API. So the question mark here indicates this is the query we're going to send to the API. So we want the fam link to be audio wide, and then we would import that right through our browser. And so again, we have to tell what the relationship is. So we'll say, this is a style sheet. And once you do that, the example that is inside of um, inside this slide is using a internal style. So it's a set of style tags defined in the head. 
and you'll see that it's it has a body selector and inside the declaration block it's using the font family property and it's setting it to audio live and it's setting that just as a text and so what's going to happen is it's going to take everything inside the body and it's going to apply that font style to it it's that easy to use google fonts super simple and so if you want to do multiple fonts you can either do multiple links or inside uh the tail end you could just separate each font name with the uh or symbol a single or symbol so the pipe character and then inside your style to make sure to import uh, or to declare the font family for each uh selector that you want to apply that style to so here's just a quick example of how you can apply three different styles to um three different fonts to three different html elements all using google uh fonts and just using one import to do that now you could just as easily have done all three different imports as well that's this is just one way of minimizing the uh, amount of code it takes to do the same thing. Uh, let's see here. And so the last thing I kind of want to talk about with the Google fonts is the API actually allows you to apply effects to those fonts. So effects might be able to get like an emboss look or a fire look or a neon look or to be able to outline the font or to give it like a three dimensionality. Don't get me wrong. This is super kitschy. Use this very sparingly. but. The idea is that you do have this uh, this power to be able to even pr uh, produce these like custom flourishes on top of these fonts. And so I, I also offer examples when you go to import, you not only import the font, but then you also tell it what effect you want to be able to apply. And when you apply this effect here, then when you go to uh, use that font, you not only have to apply the font and the font family, but to get the effect to work, you have to give a class name based off of the class name that's defined in Google's API. So for instance, to get this fire effect, it would be font-effect-fire as the class name on this heading one element that is Sophie on fire. And if you wanna know what all the class names are, I give that resource right here on this slide. So right here is a link where you can see all of those effects. Again, this is just for fun. Uh, this I could have probably done with that. I just want to show you how powerful Google's font library is. And I, I, I it's a library I use a lot. It's, 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 it's filled with a lot of really good solid fonts, uh, a, a, a lot more fonts than what the default browser might have. Okay. So with that said, the last thing I kind of want to get into is with fonts, or at least styling with fonts is to give a couple of ground rules on how you might want to pair fonts. First of all, uh, I'll give you three three basic rules to start by. Complement is going to be the first. Uh, a great font combination should harmonize, so it shouldn't be too similar and it shouldn't be too different. So uh, that ties right into the second suggestion, which is contrast is key. You don't want two fonts that are too similar because that actually causes a conflict. So you actually want to combine two fonts that are aesthetically pretty pretty different. And so that's why a lot of times when you look at uh, advertising literatures, or if you go and examine and do a, uh, an analysis on a lot of uh, professional content out there, you'll see that there's a combination of like uh, a serif and a sans serif font. So something with flourishes, something that doesn't. They both look very different, but they can still have a lot of visual similarities to them, so they can be very complementary. Uh, but they, they can contrast against each other very nicely. And so, the last suggestion I would give you is try to stick to no more than three fonts where you choose one to be the boss font and you use the other ones just to kind of um, to uh, to um, accentuate the boss font. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing you would do with colors. Typically, you wouldn't when you design a web page, use all possible colors at your disposal. Right. Typically, you would pick three colors and you would use that as your theme. Think sports teams. Sports teams typically have uh, two primary colors where one's more dominant, one's a secondary and then a tertiary color. So if we're talking about the Saints, the Saints colors are typically uh, black, gold and uh, and white. Where white is the tertiary color, gold is probably the primary color and black would be the secondary color. Uh, so just just like you would adhere to themes with color, you would adhere to themes with fonts.
So since we're talking about style and CSS, I just figured I'd throw in a little bit of the uh, UI practices at this time because it makes no sense. Uh, there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of content out there to better help you pair fonts. Uh, one of my favorites is FontJoy. Let me actually hop over here. FontJoy is really cool in the fact that uh, it generates font combinations using a deep learning algorithm. And so you, I can, it'll randomly select any font here. And you'll see it chooses three fonts, like a heading font, some kind of like italicized font, and some kind of paragraph font. Every time I reload this page, it'll create a set of fonts that complement each other. If I like one particular font, uh, if I'm using this to try to pair fonts against each other, I can lock one down here and say, oh, I really like this lower font. What other fonts go with lower font? And then I could tell it to generate, and then it'll try different fonts. I'm like, oh, I really like this Josephine font. Let me lock that and see if I can't generate another tertiary font. So this is a fun tool, but there's there's plenty more out there. Uh, I'm just I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about complementing fonts um, or getting complementary fonts because since we're talking about styling, it's not necessarily intuitive on how one puts fonts together. And so it can be done definitely in a very amateur way uh, when you're first learning this craft. Same with colors. Try to limit yourself to just three colors for a theme and not just like make a, a rainbow of colors for your uh, website, unless that's what you're going for. Okay. So we talked about colors, we talked about fonts. I want to now talk about uh, the spacing between elements in an HTML document, because that's another really critical part that CSS provides to us. So that's naturally going to bring us to what we call the box model. And we can also talk about how much uh, width and height an individual element can consume in HTML, because we can set all of that uh, within our CSS. So when I say the box model, you could think of every HTML element is just surrounded by a box. And so the actual HTML itself is this content. And then around the content, we have this invisible space that we can call padding. And then outside the padding, if we wanted to draw a border or an outline around our element, that is where this would go. So every element has the ability to have an outline around it, but I can create an amount of space between the element and the outline. Then outside of the outline, outside of the border of an element, I can produce a margin. So this is where you would have space that you can't necessarily see even if you draw a border around your element. So you have margins and you have paddings that's the big distinction between the two. Both margins and paddings produce space between your HTML elements. The distinction between them is that the padding goes between your HTML content and a border you could draw around it, whereas a margin goes outside of the border uh, and just kind of, it would nestle up to other margins of HTML documents. It should also be noted that whenever you set the width or the height of an HTML element, it's only affecting the content. So it does not affect the padding size, the border, the margin. So the actual amount of space you would consume would be whatever you set the width to, plus whatever the padding size is, plus whatever the border size is, because your border or outline could be X amount of pixels large, plus whatever your margin number is. So yeah, that naturally leads me, um, this is just a description of what I just gave you. That naturally brings me to how much width or height does each HTML element consume? Well, there's two concepts that you wanna have, actually there's three concepts that you wanna have for uh, height and width. So height and width. So every HTML element can have a height or width attribute and therefore it can have a style. So every HTML element can have a style for width and height uh, more appropriately. Um, the width and the height will define how much space it will consume inside your viewport. So you can either set that as like a pixel rating, or you could set that as a percentage rating with a percent sign, which would be the percent of the viewport it's supposed to consume. So if you want an image to have a width of 50%, then you can control no matter whether it's on a mobile phone or whether it's on a laptop, it makes a more responsive experience to set the width based off of a ratio of available viewport space as opposed to a concrete pixel space, which would be consistent on every platform. But if the viewport is variable, 
it might not uh, it might not be able to fit on a uh, on a uh, mobile phone, for instance, if you set something to twelve hundred pixels. So you do have two different measure units you can define your width and you uh, your height to, and the width and the height will force an element to be that size. Which there's two alternates. If you don't want to force something to be that size, you can also set what's called the max width and a max height, or you can set a min width and a min height. So a max width and a max height will will shrink something if it's too big, but it won't alter it if it's that size or smaller. So it sets what the max height of something's allowed to be. So say for instance, you can set the max height to be 100%. And so if you have 100, if you have an image that might be eclipse the size of the viewport, it'll rescale it to ensure that it fits in the viewport. But if you had an image that you didn't necessarily want to blow up, that you want to maintain the aspect ratio of, it would not affect that. And it's the same thing with the min height. If you had an image that you wanted to make sure was some minimal height or width, you could set that value as well. So just letting you know, you have a variety of ways to define how much width and height each HTML element can go ahead and uh, fill. Uh, another, another, I think, important component. So we talked about uh, spacing. We talked about uh, colors. We talked about fonts all for styling in CSS. Let's talk about your background. So you could do a number of things with your background. You could uh, set it to an image. You could set it to be a color. You can set it to be a combination of a color where it builds a gradient. Uh, you can, if you set an image, you could decide whether the image should not repeat and whether it should be centered or whether it should be uh, put to the top right. So you have a lot of control. You could determine whether the image should be fixed or not. So should it scroll as you scroll or should it stay pinned to that location so that it looks like it's panning off of the screen as you're moving up and down? Uh, alternatively, if you're using like a patterned image, you might want to allow it to repeat so that it fills the entire canvas space of your viewport, the entire space of your viewport. And so lots of different options and properties. I don't want to get into too many of those properties in the lectures. Just know that the labs cover, I think, four or five of these to give you a good feel of what these look like in practice. Uh, so I, I now want to move on. So the browser, as I stated before, has some default stylings. One powerful thing about CSS is it allows us to customize the default HTML elements. So just basic examples of that might be, uh, common examples would be, uh, restyling anchor elements so that they're not, they don't have that underline underneath them that the, so that they don't appear always as a blue uh, font. A lot of times when you start building your own web applications or your own websites, you want to customize what a link looks like. And so, yeah, this is really common to be able to go in and update the, uh, the default value of an anchor. Uh, lists are another one. Perhaps you don't want to use bullet points. You might want to use circles, or you might want to use squares, or you might even want to use images as your bullet, as as your uh, as the style, as the bullet point style for your list. And so you have that ability to affect all these default HTML characteristics uh, for these elements. Tables are ugly by default in HTML. You might have seen the, the table from the lab. You might want to make the table look like something that might appear in Excel, for instance. You have control over the colors of rows and tables or how it might render as a table header or as a table data. So again, all these, all these uh, examples I'm giving here are actually examples you'll do in the lab. Another might be being able to uh, have like a hover effect happen over the button. So if you hover over a button, maybe it turns red or whatnot. Excellent. So, so we talked about how we could um, redefine and customize HTML elements. We talked about fonts. We talked about spacing. We talked about colors. Uh, we pretty much covered almost everything we can do in styling and beautifying the content of an HTML document. The last thing that we have to talk about is going to be aligning our elements so that we can fit them however uh, we desire inside of the viewport. So this is going to be slightly different than just defining the spacing. This is going to define a relationship on how elements should fit across the entirety of the viewport. So aligning elements, I want to talk two different approaches 
that we have in CSS. And in fact, these are approaches that were introduced in the most uh, the newest version of CSS, CSS3. We have Flexbox, which is a layout module that makes it easy to design flexible, responsive uh, layout structures. Flexbox is something that uh, we'll rely on Bootstrap to do, but it's a good it's good to understand what's happening with Flexboxes. So Flexbox um, is a display type. Again, you'll see this in the lab. Uh, and the way that we would use a flex box is we would have to define like a flex container. A flex container might be a div or a, some block level type element inside our HTML document that we would give the style of a display type flex. And that way, anything we put, every any flex item we put in our flex container, we can then define how that content flexes over um, if we have, uh, uh, depending on what, how many flex items are inside that container. So we can get different properties if we filter something to three items versus 25 different items. Like this allows us to start building web content that's very fluid and can progressively kind of scale out and look good depending on what the uh, aspect ratio of the viewport is. Because one of the most challenging things with styles is trying to style your content that looks good, both in landscape mode, which is how you would uh, consume it on a laptop, versus styling something that would look good in portrait mode, which is how people consume content, web content, on their uh, smart device. So it's really created this big need to define a flexible approach of relaying out our um, our HTML elements based off of the size of our viewport, and that's what Flexbox does. So I just want to I just want to cover some of the main concepts behind the properties of a Flexbox. And so, given a Flex container, and again, you'll see how to actually implement this in the lab. We have a couple of pretty important properties: Flex direction, Flex wrap, justify content, align items, and align content. Uh, but they're all pretty intuitive. So let's start with flex direction. Flex direction just simply uh, tells the direction. It, it indicates the direction that you're flexing your items into. So your values for flex direction could be column. If it's column, then you could see it's going to flex them vertically. It could be column reverse, which means that instead of going top down, you go bottom up as you flex things uh, out. Uh, you have row, which would flex things uh, horizontally, or row reverse, which would do right to left as opposed to left to right. So flex direction is just whether you're going column or row order, essentially, with your flexing. Your flex wrap is either going to be a wrap or no wrap, or wrap reverse. So if you don't wrap, then it's just going to keep flexing uh, across the single row. If it wraps, then when it hits the width of your viewport, it will create a second row. So this is an example of a uh, flex wrap set to wrap. And wrap reverse would just, it would wrap it in the reverse direction. So starting from the back, going towards the front. So justify content and align items are two sides of the same coin. So I'm going to have this. So justify content is going to justify the content horizontally inside of our flex box, whereas align items is going to align things uh, vertically in our flex box. So for instance, our, our values for justify content might be we want to center our flex items inside of our flex box. So here we go with justify content, we can go ahead and center that. If I do flex start, it would left just, it would uh, left align them. If I do uh, flex end, it would right align them. If I do space around, it would center them uh, and uh, maximizing the amount of space between them. So it might put unit one here, unit three here, and uh, the, the item two here. And then the space between would try to center them uh, to minimize the amount of space while centering all the items in your flex box. Again, if this is confusing, we'll look, you'll, you'll do one of each of these inside of the lab. You'll do a center, you'll do a flex start, a flex end, and a space around, and a space between, just to see what the behaviors of those are. Then align items is similar, but it's doing it on the vertical plane of your flex box. So here's an instance where I might have one, two, three, four different flex items that all vary 
in their vertical size, but notice I'm aligning them on like this invisible line. And so the line by which I'm aligning them on uh, can, can vary. So I can either center that within the flex box. I can make it at the start. I can make it at the end. So I can either have everything centered at the top or the bottom. I can stretch everything to be the same size, or I can just use uh, the baseline. And then the last property is align content. That just allows us to say, how do we want to align the flex lines themselves? So if this is an individual flex line, align content allows me allows us to define how multiple align items get displayed. And again, that could be whether you want to maximize the amount of space between each flex line or whether you want to try to center them or stretch them or, or you know, essentially it allows you to control the amount of spacing that's happening within your viewport to try to get all of your flex items presented in as aesthetically pleasing way as possible. So this is just one way one of the ways that we have this incredibly responsive nature in our viewport to take all these different items and try to, to present them in an organized way. And so I, I, I know this might be a little confusing without actually implementing it, but I'm trying to give uh, some of the concepts before you hit the lab where you actually get to see this in practice. Uh, so this is one way of aligning our CSS, uh, our HTML elements using CSS. Another popular way is to use what's called a grid view. And so it's important to understand that grids are typically the design pattern that most web developers use to try to measure out and prototype their sites. So many web pages are based on a grid view, uh, which essentially just means that the page is divided into columns. So an example of how that might appear is that I, when, if I'm designing the prototype, if I'm drawing the content of my HTML, how my HTML is gonna be styled uh, inside my viewport, I might create a row here that represents my heading banner. Uh, this column here, um, and uh, so this might be row one, this might be row two and three and four and five, and column last might be my menu of, of options. My last row might be my footer. Uh, this might be news items. So news item one, news item two, news item three, news item four. Just out of curiosity, I, I, I bet you if I go to UNO's webpage, you can almost definably see this kind of grid-based uh, layout on the way the content is done. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to hop on over. And yeah, look, right here. I have this heading image. I have this, this next row here. Here, I all of a sudden have columns. I have a column here that represents a set of menu options. And I have a column here, which is tax. And then I have a column here, which is more menu options. And then I'm cut over here. The entire row is consumed by video. I have here, entire row is consumed by tax. Here, I have two columns. One is tax, one is an image. Here, I have um, uh, image and I have tax. So notice the content, and then at the very bottom, I have a row, which is one, two, three, four different columns. So you can see that based off of, uh, j just based off of using this as a initial, um, uh, uh, pro just, just, just for basic analysis, that we could see the layout of our UNO page is based off of this concept of a grid view. And so you actually have a display type and style called grid that you could use to define a certain amount of columns. And then you could have each item, each element that is a grid item consume that amount of columns. And you'll get a chance to look at that uh, inside of um, the lab as well. So with that said, that's a complete and utter crash course in CSS covering everything from what is CSS to how do we import CSS to how do we encode and define colors to what is the semantics versus what are selectors? What are the fonts? How can we get more fonts? How can we apply effects to fonts? How can we define spacing? How can we define alignment? Uh, I think for the most part, that covers all the key concepts you need to be able to start uh, understanding what it is CSS provides to us.
And so the next thing coming soon to a Moodle near you is going to be that CSS Crash Court Lab, the companion lab to this lecture se sequence. So I'll provide this uh, this uh, lecture for you in case you want to go through the uh, the concepts more so, and the labs will really have you go through and implement this. And so that'll lead to homework two, even though I know everyone hasn't finished homework one, but you can probably guess what homework two is going to entail. And it's going to be to apply CSS styles to each one of your pages in your interactive story. So, so that that uh, this is a uh, this is a precursor of things to come. So, with that said, we can spend the remaining amount of our time talking about some implementation details of Lab One uh, HTML. We can talk more about HTML questions, or I can field any questions about today's lecture about CSS. Uh, Although it looks like I, I actually plotted out this lecture pretty well for the amount of time I have. I think I only have, a, have about four minutes. So with that said, is there any does is there any questions anyone has about today's lecture? Is there any concepts that that uh, need a better articulation? Have I been getting messages all this time? Yep, 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 yep. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a um, so th that's another um, measure you can use too is uh, REM. Uh, uh, again, I would I would recommend checking the specifications. So this is one of the big things I would recommend doing. So for all the individual properties for CSS. You can check Mozilla. Remember, I said Mozilla MDM. It stands for Mozilla Developer Network. They have complete, essentially, APIs for HTML and CSS and uh, client-side browser-based JavaScript. And so here, like I said, CSS is a declarative language, which means once you know all the keywords and what those 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 properties, and once you know what the values of the properties can be, you have a mastery of the language, essentially. It's, it's but you could say just all the properties, all the selectors, all the things that are defined. And it's pretty extensive. And you, you're you not going to memorize all of these. The entire point of it, a reference document is to reference them. But it's just important to kind of know the categories by which these things uh, alter and update and control. And the only way you're going to le learn how what all these various things do is to keep using them. Um, so the viewport height uh, is going to compute either the viewport or the uh, viewport height or width, depending on whether you're using view W or VH, um, to compute the space in which an element should consume. Um, REM and M are uh, relative terms as they're usually typically defined by a font. And so I want to say that the computational component that REM and uh, uses is uh, a pixel. It's like um, 16, it, I want to say it's uh, 1 16th of a, a, a pixel rating or whatnot. So it, it's, it's relative towards the viewport, but it's relative based off of the amount of pixels that the viewport has. In my opinion, I, I am a bigger proponent of using the viewport height and the viewport width because I think it more consistently gives you your allocatable ratio as opposed to like a uh, the, uh, some of the other relation, uh, relative uh, um, scales you have, uh, M being one of them, uh, where, where uh, it's 16 pixels is one right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't typically use the measure of rem or m um, for uh, my own purposes. I I typically use um, uh, the viewport height to the viewport width because I, I just find that it gives me more responsiveness for my content. Uh, honestly, honestly, most of the time I just use Bootstrap. So one of the nice things about Bootstrap is uh, it essentially has all of these styles predefined for you. And you just learn the class names 
that are tethered to the styles. And when you create your HTML document, you import the Bootstrap library, you apply the names, and you get a fully responsive styled uh, uh, web page. So I, I, I almost always default to a, uh, a styling library at this point. And then maybe make custom changes as I need to with a couple of, of uh, CSS documents. Excellent. OK, well, if anyone has any further questions, and those will probably pop up as you work on uh, as you work on your um, on this lab, which I'll try to make available probably around Saturday. I'm, I'm targeting Saturday to get the lab and the homework document available on Moodle. That way you have a chance to to try it out before uh, Tuesday's uh, lecture, where I kind of want to talk about the lab work in more detail um, so, and some of the design choices that are happening in those step-by-step -step directions for both the HTML and the CSS lab. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and send an email, email out once, once this go live. But you'll see that the, uh, the lab will be a direct companion piece to this, uh, to this lecture. And I'll make these slides available through Moodle as well. And then that'll leverage just right into the homework. And then uh, probably next Thursday, I'll do another lecture just showing you some bootstrap stuff. Once we start moving to bootstrap and after the, the second homework where you have to do your own CSS, you're welcome just to use bootstrap for all your styling needs. Uh, it's important to know how to do CSS styling, but honestly, there's so many powerful frameworks out there. There's so many powerful libraries that predefine styles for you in such a powerful and responsive way that it's, it's almost better just to learn how to use those libraries. Yeah, so the first lab is due tomorrow. That is correct. And I wanted, I wanted everyone to have finished that lab to make sure that everyone understood HTML and they could start asking me about it because I want to kind of get through the HTML and CSS stuff relatively quickly so we can consume more of our semester time with uh, JavaScript. I think that that's the far more interesting language to be using inside both the browser, in both the web client and the web server. So I want to get to a point where we can start doing that. But uh, at the same time, I know that uh, it would be meaningless to jump into JavaScript without ensuring that everyone at least has a foundation, a relatively strong foundation, in what the roles of HTML is inside of the web client, what the roles of CSS is inside the web client, and where everyone can at least make responsive, presentable uh, um, um, inner, uh, um, views, essentially, uh, so that you're actually able to render things that look attractive inside your viewport. Because I know they say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but a lot of people do judge a book by its cover. So it's important to know how styling works and what some of the guidelines for good styles are. Excellent. Well, I guess if there's, okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, if there's no other questions, then I'll leave everyone with that. We had a great lecture in the first week. I think we were able to cover the meat of HTML and CSS. So we'll probably field some concepts based off of the labs on Tuesdays, what I'm anticipating. And then I'll probably do a presentation on uh, Bootstrap on Thursday. Uh, yeah, I think is what my game plan is going to be. And then once we get through Bootstrap, we can start delving into JavaScript based, in, based off of where, how we feel, how we feel as a class with our HTML, our CSS, and our Bootstrap. Excellent. Okay. Well, everyone have a great weekend. Let me go ahead and stop my recording. <laughs>